Well, time now for us to delve into our big stories, and we're talking about food price inflation, the cost of food products out there. Food security, uh, to put it mildly. We're going to assess the rising cost of that and what is accounting for that, rising cost of fertilizers and the CDs own these depreciations. But joining us this morning for a conversation as we look at this a bit, uh, we'd be announcing those guests uh, to you uh, shortly. Uh, we have traders of essential commodities at the popular Techiman Central Market who are lamenting the soaring prices of food items which have affected patronage. They want government to intervene to save the situation which has left many frustrated. And our Sabbat was in the market to speak with some of them and came through with this report. The recent hike in the prices of fuel commodities across the country has compounded to the hardship of many Ghanaians. Today, we are here at the Tichiman Central Market, which is the largest food crop market in the West African South region. We are here to engage these traders here to find out from them how the situation is impacting on their sales here at the Tichiman Central Market. Let's get interactive with these traders to have their take on the state of the increase in prices of goods. <laughs> The market is bad because every now and then there is increase in food prices and this is causing the hike in the prices of goods. I sell pepper here and I travel to Paga for my goods. When I started, the fair pay bag is 12 Ghana cities. Last year, they charge us 25 Ghana cities per bag, but today we pay 50 Ghana cities per bag. So the hike in fuel prices is affecting the prices and buyers here cannot afford it. They need the items but cannot buy due to the cost. A gallon of oil is 300 Ghana cities. Tin tomatoes is 30 cities today, and this is affecting our trading activities. We can't make profit, and even the money to give our children for school is a problem. So we are really suffering. Today, even Okada charges eight cities from here to Tamale Station. So we are really suffering. These traders say the incessant hike in the prices of goods is adversely affecting their trades as buyers no longer patronize them due to the exorbitant cost of commodities in the market. Buyers don't buy from us when the prices are high. They really want to buy, but because of the prices, they are unable to buy. So when we go for the goods, we run at loss at the end. At first, we paid 20 Ghana cities from here to Kumasi, and now it's 25 Ghana cities. Same applies to the market tools. It used to be 50 pesos, but now it's one Ghana cities. Everything has been affected, so it's compounding to our hardships. To most of the women we've been engaging, their simple plea to authorities is to ensure that mechanisms are put in place to bring down the cost of fuel prices, which according to them will also impact on transport fares. All we are going through is as a result of the food prices. So we are pleading to those in authorities to intervene because we are really suffering. We are appealing to government to come to our aid with regards to the food prices. Our plea to government is to do something about the fuel prices. Even if there's going to be increase, it should be something small so we can afford it. So this has been the situation from the Techiman Central Market. My name is Anas Sabit reporting for Joy News.
Well, uh, that is the scene from uh, the Techiman uh, market. Let's now connect uh, with some of our guests. Bismarck Owusu Note is Programs Officer, Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. We also have John Dumelo, a farmer. Uh, Mr. Dumelo, a very good morning to you. Uh, Bismarck, a good morning to you as well. Yeah, good morning. Uh, John, I think you may have to unmute. Okay, good morning. How is everything? By God's grace, very well, very well. So, so let's, let's start from the standpoint of a farmer. You are in the thick of things. Last year, uh, you were celebrating harvesting three tons of uh, ginger. But what has the system been like for you uh, in terms of producing the crops that you produce? Let's start with which crops do you produce, apart from ginger and, and, and all of that? Wh which other crops do you uh, farm? Well, good morning. Um... For starters, I, I do mainly ginger and, and cabbage, uh, ginger, cabbage, and maize. Uh, those are the three um, <clears throat> crops that I do. And then, of course, I have some um, uh, grass cutters as well. So that's what I, I, I mainly do now. Right. And, and, and what has uh, business been like in terms of growing these crops? In the last few months, we have had what has happened in different parts of the world, shocking the system, apart from even the fuel price, uh, price inflations and all of that. But we have the Russo-Ukrainian war as well. What has it been like to produce these items, let's say, in the first quarter of this year? Well, it's been tough. Um, for starters, you know, the prices of um, fertilizer has gone up. Um, the prices of uh, weedy sides, pesticides have also gone up, almost doubled over the last um, few months. I mean, before the dry season, we buy, we used to buy, you know, um, fertilizer. I mean, the 50 kg, we used to buy, you know, 250, 260, almost 300. But now it's 450 Ghana. That is even if you would get some to buy um, in the north. And, you know, so basically it's almost doubled. And the, the tractor services that we use, um, those days they would take 60, 70 CDs to plow an acre. But now you will even be lucky to get 150, somebody willing to plow your acre for 150 CDs. And so the price of, of, of cultivation has gone up. And, uh, you know, if, maybe for some of us, yes, we can, we can absorb some of the shocks. But the question is, do we pass the, the, the price increase to our consumers? Because now if you put, now you're producing a bag, for instance, ginger. I mean, now a, ginger, a bag of ginger is about, uh, let's say, 330, 340 Ghana. Okay, fine. I mean, it's gone up. We know that probably in the next few weeks, it will still go up. Do I now transfer the, the cost of it, the rising cost of it to the consumer? So now when my clients call me for bags of ginger and I say, oh, right now ginger is 350 Ghana. Hey, John, it's expensive. I'm like, it is not my fault because all the sectors in the value chain, the, the cost of production has gone up those who transport it for you, at least from, from, from the farm to maybe where you store it, they'll, they've increased their prices. Even those who transport it from the farm to Accra, they've increased um, um, their prices. I mean, and so things are tough, but we are looking at, I'm looking at the brighter side. The brighter side is people still need to eat, people still need to be fed, and we are still going to keep on pushing so that we make sure that, you know, um, we, 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 we ensure, I mean, so that we ensure that everything goes on well in this country. We, I mean, we are not, we are not going to be deterred. Uh, we're just still going to keep on pushing so that everybody will have food on their tables at, at the end of the day. Uh, but, but let me find out from you, are, are these prices deterrent? I mean, are they pushing you out of market? You may be in a special uh, place where maybe, like you said, you can afford to absorb some of these and not pass all of them uh, to your customers. But if you look at it generally, is this, right. are these price inflations? And I'm just looking at what you've said. Fertilizer prices going up from 250, 260 CDs to about 400 CDs. Uh, getting people to work with uh, tractors, which would have cost you about 50, 60 CDs. Now, they would not charge you anything less than 150 and, and all of that. Uh, are these deterrent? Are they hampering your farming activities? Well, it is, of course. It's hampering because um, if you look at this year, um, I was trying to increase my production from about 200 acres to maybe 300 acres. But when you look at the cost of it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a deterrent because I'm like, look, whatever, whatever money I'll use to do the 300, 
right now is the same money that we're using to cultivate the 200 acres. And so I might as well just still do the 200 acres and, 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 and so that I don't, I don't get at a loss. And so it's a little bit of a deterrent, but the brighter side, like I always say, is people need to eat all the time. Somebody has to farm. Somebody has to, to, to what do you call it, uh, provide, you know, the food stuff. And also the number of people we employ, you can't just say, okay, you know, this year you're not going to farm. What about those who help you, the farm hands on the farm? What are you going to tell them? What about those who transport your goods for you? What about even those who are even going to bag your goods for you? And so you, you can't just say you're, you're, you're stopping because prices are going, going up. We, we need to keep on moving forward. It, it, it is a deterrent. I mean, if you look at full cost alone, I mean, a couple of days ago, I went to the farm and I came back. And I'm now spending 30%, I'm buying 30% more fuel to go to the farm and back. And You're buying 30% sad, sad... more fuel? I mean, yes. I mean, look, I, I used to fill my tank uh, 600, 650, but now it's 900 Ghana CDs. I mean, it, 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 that's the sad reality. I, I mean, I nearly took a picture of it yesterday and I posted it, but I was like, this is bad. I mean, now it's 30%. It's gone up 30%. And I'm sure a lot of people will now attest to the fact that, you know, of course, floor prices are, are, have gone up. And so, but still, you can't just leave people hanging. People need to be fed. People need to be employed. Families need to be fed. And so we're going to keep on pushing and we're just going to hope for the best. Uh, just before I move on to uh, Bismarck for a few, uh, you know, thoughts uh, there, I just want to find out from you, do you get any subsidized fertilizers? I don't know which belt you are in, in terms of your category when it comes to uh, farming. I, I mean, the level, you're you are farming some 200 acres, you were hoping to expand to 300. Yeah. So it's not a small yeah. scale farm, but do you get any subsidized fertilizers that may be cushion you? No, I don't. I don't at all. I mean, the few times I've tried to get subsidized fertilizers, I mean, the reality on the ground is that everything is being politicized. Um, you, you, when you go to some places for the subsidized fertilizer, though, you, you need certain um, requirements, which of course I, I don't. I, 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 I requirements, don't have requirements like like what? Like what? I mean, I mean, you have to be a, a present party person before you can get fertilizer. I mean, that's the reality on the ground, especially in the north. You know, so unless you want to pass it through somebody else, and I mean, it's a long process. Um, so I don't get access to. Um, what do you call it? I don't get access to um, uh, subsidized fertilizer. And a lot of people are also not getting access to subsidized fertilizer because the requirements are just illegal. Uh, uh, ho ho hold for me, uh, uh, John. Let me, let me engage Bismarck as well. Bismarck Usunoti, Programs Officer, Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. What John Dumelo says, is that reflective for you of the reality on, on the ground? And, and we know, for example, that in Ukraine, Russia, these petroleum products, one of their derivatives is fertilizer. And so with what is happening there, it has also impacted the fertilizer market. But, but I'll get into that. But, but is that the reality, uh, as John Dumelo paints it, that you see in your association as far as members are concerned? Well, good morning and good morning to your viewers. Uh, even John, John is, a, a, I call him a privileged farmer. So if you have someone like John, who is a privileged farmer, who is able to absorb some of these costs, is even complaining, then you can consider the plight of the smallholder farmer who is doing a one acre or two acres of land. Mm. And I think John, John put it in the right uh, perspective when he spoke about the rising cost of production when it comes to uh, uh, producing his, his crop. Now, if you take a critical look at the smallholder farmer, and uh, for purpose of the discussion, I want to use even just this as a case study. Now, last year, last year, if you want to produce an acre of maize, just one acre, you'll be spending close to about 1,700 Ghana cities last year. So when you are doing fertilizer, we are doing your weight size, you are doing your labor, harvesting, all those things, you spend 1,700 for one acre. Now, for this year, uh, we are still compiling the cost because even costs are still going up every day. But what you've done so far, this year, an average farmer is going to spend about 3,300 seeds to cultivate on the same acre of land. Just look at the difference, just within the space of one year. 
you rightly mentioned the issue of the fertilizer. Last year, and for some of the farmers, luckily for us, we have some of our farmers who benefit from the subsidy program. Last year, if you are getting a subsidy fertilizer, the 25 kg, you would pay around uh, 53 Ghana cities for a 25 kg. This year, the prices that have been released by MUFA is that for a 25 kg fertilizer, you are paying 160 Ghana cities. John spoke about the weed size, which has gone up, transport sales, which has gone up, tractor, which has gone up, and everything that has gone up. So the effect of what we had last year is what we are feeling this year. So last year's costs from 2020 to 2021, the resultant effect is probably low production, and the current hikes in fall prices is causing us what we are experiencing now, where we are having high cost of fertilizer, high cost of fuel, coupled with the shortage that we experienced last year, hence the prices we are facing now. The that situation that I'm telling you is that even for next year, it's going to be worse. And that's you, you project that it's going so to be worse in 2023. Why? Why, why do Actually, you make that projection? So that's the point I was making. That last year, when we produced for an acre of maize, you will need 1,107 Ghana cities last year. This year, if you are producing, you need more than 3,300 Ghana cities. Your cost of production has increased by more than 80%. What happens is that when you produce, the final product will definitely see some increases to make up for the high cost of production that you incurred. Mind you, for next year, too, you'll be experiencing issues regarding maybe high fuel prices. You might be experiencing issues regarding high transportation prices. That might also what add up to the cost. So we should, we should be bracing ourselves for a higher increase in input prices. Now, the, the challenge even for this year is that I think uh, quite recently we heard from the Ghana meteorological agency, who are predicting that even this year, you might experience low rainfall. And to the extent that if you look at our agroecological zones very well, you realize that in the middle belt, we normally have two planting seasons. So they have the major and the minor season. The major season normally starts around, the, around this time, March, April, they plant by July, August, they harvest, and they wait till September, they start again till around November. From what the Agency are telling us because of the delayed rain, even those in the middle bed who are normally supposed to start planting in the middle season, they have to push their plant to around July. So if you are not even careful, we might be having just one season in the transition in the, in the middle bed, which normally have two seasons. So it means that you are even having a reduction of the production capacity. So if you add up all these factors, the high cost of production, high input cost, the expect expectation of low rainfall, my brother, the situation now is not pleasant, but what might happen in next year might even be worse. So I, I think that there is a need to put in measures to ensure that we avert the hardships and the consequences of these things that we have on consumers and on Ghanaians. Mm. And if, if you had to assess, for example, uh, how much more people have to put in to cult cultivate, let's say, an acre of farm, whether it is maize or beans or, or some other product, cabbage like maybe John DeMello uh, farms as well, w what would you say? How much more are farmers having to invest just to make up, to, to produce the same at the same levels? Well, it, it, it depends on the type of crop that you are, you are talking about. Mm. But if you are looking at just, let's say, the cereals where we normally focus on maize or even rice, you should be having an extra thousand or thousand two cities in addition, in addition to what you had last year to produce. So the question would be that extra thousand, thousand two cities, who is bearing the cost? You expect the farmer to absorb that cost if the farmer doesn't have the capacity like John? How do the farmer absorb that particular cost? So it's a serious situation, my brother. It's a serious situation. And there are some instances where the cost may be even up to 2000 So normally, what a rational farmer or a rational person would do 
And as John rightly mentioned, is that you cut back production. So, for instance, if you had planned to do three acres this year, looking at the cost of it, you realize that, no, I can't do three acres. Let me just do my one acre. For some farmers who normally would like to apply fertilizer on their field, especially if you go to northern parts of the country, where due to their, the nature of the soil, they need good uh, uh, regular application of fertilizer. If a farmer is not able to get fertilizer because of one high cost or two unavailability, what he will do is that either he reduce the acreage that he's doing, or, or what he will do is that instead of focusing on crops that require fertilizer, he might diversify to other crops that might not necessarily require heavy application of fertilizer. So, for instance, crops like cassava, crops like yam, they, they are able to withstand a, 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 a pressures without fertilizer. So, mm. if the farmer is saddled with this situation, he has the choices to make. He can decide to stop farming completely, reduce his acreage, diversify. And in all cases, it has an effect on the final productivity. Uh, let, let me come to you, John. How have you had to cope? You've mentioned that you would have wanted to scale up from 200 acres to about 300, but on the back of some of these developments, you've not been able to do that. But how have you in small terms, try right. to cope with the situation. I mean, fuel prices are up. If you want to use the tractor and if you want to get people to work on the farm for you, that is up. Fertilizer prices are up. How have you put things together to be able to still produce? I, I think that um, for us, it's just about scaling down. Um, so yeah. if, for an example, if right now an acre, to plow an acre, using tractor services is 150 CDs per acre, which has gone up almost double. So if I wanted to do, let's say 100 acres, and I'm paying 150 CDs per acre, that's, um, that, that's about 15,000. Um, but hitherto, I would have done twice that amount. And so now it's just about scaling down. Uh, we just have to scale down so that whatever amount of money we can use to, to, I mean, whatever money we were using to, were projected to use for the 300, we are, we'll now just scale it down to about 150. And that is going you, to. You, you reduce, mean you're actually you know, contemplating scaling down from 200 acres to about 150 when you were projecting yes, because, to move to 300 acres? Yes, because that's the only way forward. And, and, and not just for me, for many other farmers as well who are, who, are, who are doing one acre, two acres, three acres, and hoping this year they were doing five. They'll scale down to. One, they'll still do one or two just because, uh, you, you know, uh, we don't have um, enough uh, liquidity to be able to produce more because we don't want to get into a situation where you do it and now you cannot even afford fertilizer. Now it's 450. What if by middle of the year it goes to six or 700 CDs? Then your crops are going to die. And the sad aspect of, of being a farmer is when you get on your farm and your crops are dying and there's really nothing you can do about it. No help from anywhere. And, and, and it's a sad situation. And so it's just for farmers this year to scale down and just see how best they can survive. And of course, scaling down means the, fri the prices of food, you know, is going to go up. And, you know, um, by the middle of the year or maybe even end of the year, we, we're just going to pay double for whatever bag of rice or bag of maize or bag of ginger or bag of... Um, of, 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 of cabbage that we produce. Let me give you an example. Um, in December, in December, January, a uh, price of cabbage was about 1,008, 1,009. I mean, on a normal day, that price of cabbage should be about three or 400 CDs. You know, now it's come down a bit because a lot of, uh, a lot of people are, 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 have harvested, but during the year, it's gonna go back up because they need a lot of fertilizer. I mean, cabbage needs, requires a lot of fertilizer, a lot of weedicides, a lot of pesticides, and this is, of course, going to, the only way, honestly, the only way is to pass it down to consumers. And if you pass it down to consumers, some will say that they can't afford it. And, and, and so it, it's a really serious situation. And, but I'm looking at the brighter side. What are the ways, what ways can we, you know, solve this problem? Because the other way, the only way to solve the problem is, is if we import. And that's not what we want. Of course, the exchange rate has gone up. Um, if you look at the Poultry, Poultry Farmers Association, uh, you know, now, now the cost of producing has gone up. And if we don't take time, uh, very soon we might even start importing eggs into this country because it might be a cheaper, uh, you know, avenue just, just for consumption. Now, having, having made mention of some of these matters that you've spoken of, so it is inevitable that food prices in the next few months 
are still going to go up. I mean, I've, I've had people tell me they've gone to market and, and purchased one, a single tomato for one city. I mean, I've had people yes. say that three small ones for two cities. I've gone to market right. myself at a point, and you know, some of these have reflected. So that is the reality. And in the next few months, we can only expect them to go higher. It's good yes, to yes, of, of, of course. Um, the next few months are going to go higher. But, you know, like, like um, my brother said, the major planting season has started. And so once it started, a lot of people are planting now. By June, July, a lot of people will harvest. So the prices might come down because a lot of people are harvesting. Mm. But after that, you know, the prices are going to shoot up because after that, the, the, after that, what you need now is more irrigation services, more fertilizer services, more agricultural services. And that is when you see that the prices of food will go up. So, so let, let us not be, for lack of a better word, let us not be fooled when a lot of people are harvesting. Then some people will come out to say, oh, you know, right now the plantain is, is cheap, where a bundle is three cities or four cities. And so because of that, you know, agri is booming in this country. No, every year things like that happen. You have a glut. Every year that's what's going to happen. But that is not the reality on the ground. The reality on the ground is that the farmers need a lot of help and a lot of support. And that is what we need. And we need it at this point. But, but, and, and that brings me to a point. I'll put this question to both of you, starting with you, John. That means uh, we should even be careful when we have gluts. We should be trying to store up, save. Uh, in this country, we don't have a, a proper silo system to store grains and all of that, like maize. And, but maybe we should be looking at that because it means that when the season is gone, Things are going to hike up. Prices are going to hike up. And if we could store, it would have been the best opportunity when it's the May season or the yam season at the end of the year to do so. So that when the lean season comes, uh, the prices will, will be pretty stable. Yes, exactly. And, and so, yes, one, we need storage, good storage facilities, which, of course, come at a cost. And it, will, it would be sometimes it's best that you don't put everything, you know, to the hands of the, the, the private um, the private guys. The government will help us or to help the, the, the agricultural space by building up um, what you call storage facilities as the first one. The second one is also adding value to what we produce. So let me give you a perfect example. Like ginger like this. In the next few months, ginger, the price of ginger will go up. But like I've done converting them into ginger paste and, and so on and so forth. So when you convert into ginger paste, you're able to store it for a bit. So that when the prices go up and still, the, the the prices of the ginger paste is still stabilized because you 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 would have stored a lot of it and now sell. Same with garlic, same with tomatoes and so on and so forth. And so once we start adding value to something like tomatoes, when the prices start going up, we just take it from wherever we stored it and then just, you know, just release it on the market so that they can cushion, you know, the consumers for, for a month or two or three till you know the new harvest season comes and so adding value to whatever we produce is also very very important so storage number one and two adding value to it and so sometimes when we have a glut and the farmers will say oh you know their their produce are getting rotten on the farm and so on and so forth it hurts it hurts it hurts most of us so it hurts a lot of people because it's like what can we do to be able to help these farmers and also ultimately help the consumers so that the prices are stabilized. And with this, um, I, th I think the government should really come in a lot to be able to help us to, to store these goods very well so that at the end of the day, everybody is happy. In question. So you agree with him then that things are only going to get worse. He projects that in 2023, things are going to get even worse. Oh yes, of course. Twenty twenty three things are going to get worse. Um, I saw that one. Is is not is. There's no doubt about it. Things are going to get worse, and and but of course, of course, it will get worse, and then hopefully it will get better for us as farmers. We 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 don't want a case where we always say, "Oh, things are getting worse. Things are getting worse." Right now, it's a it's a very you know it's a very unstable situation. No, we want the best for farmers. One, two, we want the best for consumers, and we want the best for the country as a whole. We want to be able to say that at the end of the day, we've been able to produce enough food to last us the whole year. We've been able to produce enough maize to last us the whole year, enough rice to last us the whole year, enough cassava to last us the whole year, so that the prices are stabilized. So that you know that when you pick a bag of maize, 
when you know that when you pick a bag of maize and let's say now let for for an example let's just say a bag of maize now is maybe 250 cities you can project that in august or september it will still be 250 cities because we have enough stocks there to last us and that is what we need to be looking at and that's what that is what will give us you know food security uh, just hold for me uh, john hold for me uh, let, let me also uh, bring in this bit uh, before I come back to Bismarck. Mango farmers, uh, of course, in the Yilokrobo municipality have started selling off their farms following the invasion of a disease that is ravaging large tracts of farmlands uh, there. Known as bacteria black spot, the bacteria attacks leaves, twigs, as well as the mango fruit. Uh, check this out, Samuel Kojo Brace uh, reports. <laughs> discouraging to be frank it's discouraging because you invest a lot you invest so much and then at the end of the season when you are ready to have it you see bbs destroy your fruits and most of the farmers have started selling their, for their farms because of this particular bbs issue obed amevo owns this 10 acre mango farm here at Somenya. Mango farming has been his livelihood in the past 15 years. Obed says all looked good until recently when disaster struck. A disease called the bacterial black spot, popularly known as BBS, attacked farms in yellow crubble and its environs, and his was not spared. Last year alone, he lost more than half of his investment to this disease. This BBS issue has been a problem for all the farmers, all mango farmers for the past years. And surprisingly, we've been making all the noise, but for instance, last season, last season I was supposed to harvest for HPW after farm assessment. When they did the farm assessment, I was hitting almost 35, 36 tons. I was only able to harvest less than, I got just about 11 tons. What? Yes. And they can testify to that, HPW can testify to that. The association also did this assessment and that is what is happening. Even if you can look, you can look on the ground now, you see, this is as a result of last season. And nobody knows what will happen this season because the rains have not started yet. But once the rain starts, nobody knows what will happen. It's really bad. It's really making us lose a lot. That's the truth. Preferably when you come and then you scout for the mangoes, you come and then you look on the mango and then you see the symptom. For now, you can see these symptoms over here. You see some water dripping. Sometimes it might be as a result of cattle as cut. But as a farmer who has been doing the, or who have been in the farming for a long time, when you look at this side, you see that there's a mark over here before the water is dripping out. So these are the symptoms of the BBS. So this a direct symptoms of BBS. So normally, it cracks like this, the water drips. And then when it rains, when it rains, with humid conditions, then they begin to multiply. You see this as one. The next two days or three days when you come, you see another mark here, you see another mark here, and then you can identify that here, yeah, this is indeed BBS. The biggest challenge is funds. You see, we need funds and we need research, proper research to be done. Currently, this one, do the, the coming cars, when they bring it, we are doing it, you see somebody's doing somewhere, someone is doing this one somewhere, but we need the government to get involved. There is that Greek, that Greek institutions to get involved, the investors should get involved, because that is the only way we can solve it. Because it's the whole Ghana, not only, you know, it's the whole Ghana, the whole mango industry is on its nails. And if we don't solve it, the system will collapse. We will lose our investment, and to be honest, a lot of people will be unemployed. So why don't we invest into it? You know, sir? Yes. So that's the, the biggest thing is funds, and then the research works. Well, uh, that full documentary will air on The Pulse at 3 p.m. Later today, you can get the full details from there. But it also paints the picture of how farmers are struggling, whether it is uh, mango, pineapple, cabbage like Don, John Dumelo Farms, or even ginger. But let me come to you quickly, Bismarck, before I come back into the studio. Bismarck, for you, so when you look at um, this uh, bit to do with a glut, for example, how are your members, how are you positioning yourselves to avoid that? Because it, it appears in this year, 
we simply can't afford a glut because those same food products will be needed in the course of the year. And any gluts will be inimical to your fortunes and the, the Ghanaians who would want to purchase your products. Well, the issue of how farmers will address gluts it's a bit uh, uh, difficult for the small order farmer or farmers in general. Uh, John mentioned, I think, two things that could be done to address the issue of blood, uh, issues about storage and issues about processing. Now, when you come to storage, uh, farmers in their own way have means of storing their produce, but they ha their storage capacities are quite low. So what happens is that if a farmer, for instance, produces, let's say, 10 bags of maize, Maybe his capacity is to be just with about five bucks. So what he can do is to just store the five bucks up and then keep the remaining five. Maybe a week of that time to to, to, to so uh, there's a market in the store. Other farmers to have higher storage capacities where they can they can store more than that. But a lot of them do not have it. So what happens is that once they produce them, they produce the crop, they just wait on their farm for either the market wings or the aggregators to come over and purchase them. So at that moment that the glass starts, because there are a lot of these food stuff on the floor, because they have no place to store them, they have kept it like just stored and they might lose everything. So they can sell them at the giveaway prices to these aggregators. When these aggregators buy them, some of them fortunately also have storage capacities. So they go and store them. Others do not have, so they push them to the market. When it gets to the market, you have series of various products coming. So there's a whole lot of products in the system. There's glass. Prices come down, we are all happy. But the reality is that when it's now the lean season and you don't have them, you have little of those produce in the warehouses. So if they are little, the farm, some of the farmers or even the aggregators, they anticipate or they do their own calculation and forecasting and realize that if they can still hold on to it for a bit, the price will continue to shift up. And as it shifts up, it's to the advantage. So what can be done, as John said, is to look at our storage system very well. We, we have a program that the ministry have their one district, one warehouse program. In fact, I can attest that if you go around some of the districts, you'll see this warehouse, uh, warehouse started. Unfortunately, they are not in use. So when the farmer produces, there's no avenue to go and store that particular produce, let alone expect that in the lean season it can be released. Also, there was a key role or there's a key mandate of the uh, buffer store company, what you normally call the NAFO. And their role is that when the farmers produce and they sell their produce and there's excess, NAFCO or NAFCO would come in, buy the excess and store them. You store them and you wait till the new season when we have less on the market, then release them. In that way, you are controlling prices because prices will not shoot up because there's no shortage in the market. Mm. Unfortunately, NAFCO is not able to play its mandate very well. Right. So you are not able to do that. In addition... Uh, John also spoke about value addition. Unfortunately, this is not a concept that is doing very well in the Ghanaian system. You know, there are people who really speak about the real division of labor where they feel that a farmer's work is to farm and produce. In terms of value addition, there should be a whole value to a whole person who does that. Unfortunately, our systems are not structured very well. So you might have a few farmers who are able to do value addition. But unfortunately, it's not done on a large scale. So most of the time, what we produce is what we just sell. So until we attack the main issue of addressing storage, until we ensure that we have our institutions working to mop up excess and release them when they leave them, we are still going to have these perennial challenges. When the glass, we will all be happy, we will buy it at low prices and we will all, we will all to live. When right. it's a season, the price will shoot up and it will suffer. That's a general problem. Uh, hold for me, gentlemen. Hold for me, John. Hold for me, Bismarck. Evan Stremenson is a farmer as well and see. Thank you, uh, Evans, for joining Thank the you. conversation. You farm, what, 500 acres of land? Yes, 500. What, what do you plant? Um, I do cassava. Cassava? Only cassava, yes. And what else? Only cassava. Only cassava? Yes. 500 acres yes. of cassava? Cassava, what, yes. What, what type of cassava? I know there are different types depending on what you want yes, um, the end product to be. Um, I do uh, one we call tapioca manioc type 1, which, okay. which, is, uh, which is called in our local parlance, uh, sika. Sika. Sika banche. Tapioca manioc type, type one. one. And then we have the type two, which is called um, uh, Isam. Mm. I mean, these are improved um, 
varieties that is used for starch. Okay. It could be used for flour, gary, ethanol, um, uh, multidextrin, and then and some other things. Now, the, the cassava industry, uh, I think that if we're able to um, uh, zero in on research and then uh, investment right. in the cassava industry, I think that uh, we can be able to turn our economy around. Just, and, just even with the cassava industry? Yes. Yes, just, just, just with the cassava industry. Mm. Just alone, with the cassava alone. Mm. We can industrialize the cassava and, and use it to turn our economy out. You, you know what? Um, um, just uh, recently, around 2019, okay, uh, we imported only starch, about 300 tons of starch, amounting to almost about $200 million. Wow. And that $200 million could have been injected into the economy could have created jobs and, and other things. So I think that we need to really look at our food system and how our food economy and ecosystem is, is and then try to bring um, uh, uh, research, development. Uh, we have to have a strategic, intentional approach mm. to how we do our farming uh, in Ghana. Okay, so cassava, yes, and, and it directly affects you because you're a cassava farmer. But looking at the chain broadly and focusing again on, on what you farm, what has been the impact of fertilizer prices going up, uh, the cost of labor, the cost of tractors and all of that? I mean, pain for us, your colleagues have already uh, elaborated on that, but what is your reality farming in 2022? The reality is that uh, it's going to uh, uh, continue to uh, create stress for us. Because so, so let's detail the stresses. Yeah, so what, what is purchasing, what has changed when it comes to purchasing it, fertilizer? It, it simply means that- Getting uh, labor and uh, all of that. The, uh, the, the purchasing power will go down mm. because uh, initially uh, we're selling uh, MPK for 53 cities. Mm. Now MPK is 160 Ghana city. It was 53? 53. 53. How, how long ago was that? Uh, around uh, 2001, just last year. MPK, you mean 2021? 2021. Fertilizer it was 53 cities? In the market, yes, it was 53 cities. And now you're getting it down? I'm buying it for 160 Ghana. That's, that's about a 300%. 160 Ghana. So if I'm going to do, if I'm doing, 500, if I'm doing 500 acres and I'm supposed to buy a fertilizer for maybe 200 bucks, you can imagine the amount of, I'm going to use. So what we are seeing, the impact is that until the government steps in quickly, quickly, I mean, it should be a matter of agency. Farmers cannot be able to produce the food that our country will require. And here again, um, I'm on the village. Uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the village level, I deal with farmers at the rural communities. And you can see how many of them are diversifying their farms into other things. Some are, some are into mining, for into example. Into mining. Some selling are, to Galamsees. Some are moving to Galamsees. Some are selling to Chinese people. Some are giving out to Lebanese and, and all that. Many of them have even left the farm. They are doing small, small shops in the, in the village and selling uh, um, uh, uh, toffees and milk and, 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 and other things. Why? Because they can't afford you know, to purchase fertilizer, even a tractor coming on your farm to plow. Okay, last year, plowing was around 120 Ghana. Today, plowing is 250 at my level. At your level? At my level. 500 acres? Yes, 500 acres, 250. At Mampon, right now, right now, if you go there, they will tell 250, plowing one acre. So if I'm plowing for 500 acres, and I intended to do 700 acres, but because of the prices and because of the cost of fuel and diesel and all that, I may not be able to do 700. So we, we, the, the, the global uh, crisis, you know, uh, have had an impact on us mm. as a farmer. But what you are saying is that um, we want the government uh, to really step in, otherwise we won't be able to uh, feed our country. The food crisis, it's real. And there's a difference between uh, food uh, availability and food accessibility. The fact that there is food on the market doesn't mean that uh, the poor can access the food. Right. So we, we, we have to look at it because there's, there may be food on the market. There may be cassava, there may be yam, there may be tomatoes on the market. But can the poor and the vulnerable access those things? Do they have the purchasing power to do that? That, that is the question. And, and I just did the math here. So uh, you said 150 per acre, right? Uh, 250. 250 per acre. Now, when you do the mathematics, uh, 250 CDs by 500, 
you get 125,000 Ghana cities. So that is what it costs you. To do only the plowing. To do, to plow your 500 plowing. acres, 125,000 yes, Ghana cities. you have to do um, a region, and the region too will cost the same amount. You may even have to do harrowing. Wow. And so if you cost it, then you are getting into almost about $100,000 there about. And then the labor cost, every one acre, as they, 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 you do one, one labor for one, one it would be around 150 Ghana city. For, um, last year it was 100 Ghana, but th this year it will be 150 Ghana for labor. Mm. Then the planting. Has, it, has this led you to think of downsizing? John says he was thinking of doing 300 acres this year, moving from 200 acres. He's had to downsize to about 150 acres. Is this making you contemplate downsizing from... 500 acres, which would also mean that you're going to produce less. Well, the, uh, based on, uh, in my context, I think that the cassava industry is very profitable. It's 100% on return. Mm. So uh, uh, I will not be able to dance. Well, I was thinking of expanding mm. to about 700 acres. Mm. But because of the prices and the cost of diesel and, uh, and other things, I may want to maintain... And diesel has really gone exactly, up. Exactly. I may want to maintain the 500 for this season and see how the next season turn out, then I may want to uh, expand. But what I'm saying is that we really have to have a conversation about how to industrialize cassava if you want to really push our food index up. Because mm. cassava is key to growing our economy, is key to expanding our uh, uh, foreign direct investment, is key in adding value. The thing that cassava can do in our country, if, if, if you all have to have our eyes on cassava, and look at how it, it, is, it is done and the value addition. I tell you, we can do much for our country. We can right. do so much foreign exchange for our country. Let, 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 let me come to you, John. And, and I'm so grateful that you've stayed with us uh, all through this while because this, this is a very important uh, conversation. John, so uh, Bismarck was talking about value addition and the problems involved. Right. I know sometime last year, Mellow Foods, you started processing ginger into ginger <clears throat> paste. What are some of the crucial problems you are facing doing that? Because we want value addition to the products, but what are the bottlenecks you are facing, John? I think the key, the key problem is um, access to finance. Um, I mean, look, like, yes, last year I started adding value to the ginger, uh, you know, uh, converting the ginger into ginger paste, you know, packaging and everything. But if I want to scale up, it's going to be a huge problem. As we speak right now, I'm putting up a processing, uh, a ginger processing factory, you know, in the Guan district. And it, everything is self-financed. But I'm doing it step by step. But if we had, and when I say we, I'm talking about farmers. If we had, you know, financial institutions like coming to say, look, we have identified you. We've identified, let's say, uh, Mr. Bismarck. We've identified Mr. Evans. We've identified John. We've identified one, two, three people. We know you are into a great. This is what we can do to help. I think it is, it is going to help all of us. And so for me, um, the rate at which I want to grow is not how I'm going in terms of the farming aspect because everything is self-financed. But if you look at the bigger picture, if you look at the vision that we, the farmers, we want to get to, I think we just need a lot of support. Now, Mr. Evans mentioned something about, I mean, when you, when you also did the calculations, 125,000 cities just for plowing. I mean, that's a lot of money, you understand. And, and for us, we can't also use that same amount of money to buy tractors and put down, and then every year we use it. I mean, that's, that's really not going to be beneficial to us. And so if you had somebody like the government coming in to say, okay, we've identified Mr. Bismarck, we've identified Evans, we've identified John, we've identified these people. What do you need? Okay, your tractor service is 125000 Okay, fine. We have tractors. We'll pay you. We'll bring the tractors onto the farm. You know, well, just pay 10,000 CDs, which is almost, you know, whatever the cost. I mean, that's really going to help him to scale up and then eventually help a lot of people. And so for us as farmers, access to credit is very, very difficult. And, you know, and it, it, it's really hindering our progress. And value addition is something that can really help grow the agri industry. So if I'm adding value to my ginger that I produce, and others are also adding value to tomatoes, to watermelon, I mean, to other things as well. Imagine the number of factories or processing plants that can be set up across this country, the number right. of jobs it could produce, and the number of foreign exchange we are going to earn as a country, all because we added value to whatever it is we are producing. Mm -hmm. And that is what is important. We need, to, we need to have a different mindset from just producing to just 
consumption. We need to now shift it to producing, to processing, to consumption, so that you have different aspects or different varieties of whatever it is we produce. And mm. so that is what that's the conversation we should start looking at. The key point is efficiency. That is what we should look at. Efficiency makes things very, very easy. When you go to America and so on and so forth, just about a few, two or three or even 5% of the population are farmers. Yet, they are so effective that mm. they, they actually stabilize the food security. But when you come to Ghana, you have a lot of people getting into farming. Yet, we don't have a stable food security system. So that means efficiency is key. Research is also key. We need to start investing into our research institutions, CSIR, um, all these other uh, uh, research institutions, I know they've done a lot of research. We need, we need to go to them, sit down with them, dialogue with them and say, look, let's take cassava, let's take ginger, let's take cabbage, let's take coconut, let's take um, all the plants. You, we know you've done research on it. How can we, how can we now finance those research uh, proposals and right. put them into practice? Right. That is the only way we can move forward with research and development. And, and, and it, it, it's very important. The United States, like you mentioned, just about 3 to 5% of the population. Same in Brazil, a place where I've yeah. actually seen these farmers. And they are the big boys, so to speak. They are the one with the capital, the farmers, the vast swathes of land, and they have the money. The question is, uh, can we replicate same here so that farmers can actually be self-sufficient? But let me ask you this. And, and I think it's a question I'll, I'll ventilate across you know, the, the guests we have. Is farming still profitable as you, John Dumelo, uh, see it currently? Is it still profitable uh, even if you decide not to pass on all the burden onto the, um, the, the buyers? And would you still, I've heard you time and again talk about encouraging young people to get into farming. I'm one of those who, who want to go there, but uh, the capital involved. So... Is it still profitable as it is now for you? And would you still advise Ghanaian youth, for example, today to go into farming? Well, the word profitable is relative. Uh, if somebody makes 1%, he will say it's, 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 it's profitable. If somebody makes 50%, he will probably say it's not profitable. So the word profitable is relative. But moving forward, I think farming is, is okay. It, it, but, but the thing about farming is once you make money, a little money out of farming, you are thinking of reinvesting back into, into, into your farms to scale up production. And so, yes, farming can be profitable, but farming is all about times and seasons. And so if, if you are able to gauge the times and seasons very well, you will make money in farming. And farming is dedication. It's not about you've planted and you are in a crowd, you've come home and then two or three weeks later, you go back. No, you have to dedicate all your time to farming. With regards to the youth getting into farming, I think that's the only way forward. Uh, be before before, you, before you get into the youth, so I'm trying to find out now, yeah. though you are complaining of all these components, prices of fertilizer, diesel, and all of right. that, is it still profitable right. for you? It will be profitable if I, if, I, if I transfer the cost to the consumer. That is the, that's the reality on the ground. I mean, yes, it is profitable, but if I transfer it, I spend most of my costs to the consumer, it will be, it will be very profitable. That's the, that's the reality on the ground. All right. So, so get into the youth bit uh, very quickly. Would you yes. still encourage young yes. people to go into farming? Oh, yes. I would encourage young people to go into farming. But you have to start on a smaller scale. Just start on a smaller scale and then scale up once you, you, know, once you see the profits and once you see the ins and outs. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people have... I mean, the good thing about Ghana is we all have families and our families all own land in our little villages and our towns and our, you know, small cities and so on and so forth. So access to land, I don't think is a problem. What is the problem is access to credit to be able to start. And so, right. I mean, then you can, you, can, you can start with one acre and just see how things go. And the next year you scale up and then the following year you scale up. And then mm. that's, that's how we'll make, you know, um, farming attractive. I think, I think on a much national scale, we should be able to bring back Operation Feed Yourself just like they're doing in the 70s. Just feed yourself, just plant, see how things are going, and you see how we would develop the interest in farming. Okay. And that is the only way forward. Hold for me. Let me bring in Bismarck. Uh, John is saying we should relaunch Operation Feed Yourself, where people were actually uh, growing whatever they would eat in backyard gardens and all of that. My own family did that in, in, the, in the 70s. But I, I just want to find out uh, from you, is farming 
profitable. He's talking about starting small, one acre, two acres. But for the members of your group, Bismarck, uh, from what they tell you, is farming still profitable? Briefly on that. The, the profitability of farming in Ghana hinges on a lot of factors, right? Uh, in advanced countries where you have uh, certain specific systems, you are certain of irrigation, so you know, when you know there's an alternative. You are certain of uh, financial credit at very good rates, so you can go, go to them. You are certain of extracted markets, you know, once you produce, there are people ready to buy. You are certain of a certain price. Unfortunately, in Ghana, the parts of our systems are not structured. It's based on seasons, as Don said. So if you are lucky and farm in a period where the rains are good, they're not excessive, yeah, there's no doubt. Uh, uh, data is available, you're able to get back it. Yes, you make, you make quite some good money. But if you're unfortunate and you plant in a period where the risks don't come, unfortunately, you might have pests for diseases affecting your farms. You don't have access to agrochemicals. You are producing, you don't have a, a ready market and stuff like that. Then you really, really will get into getting the money. That's the reality. So it's not a really straightforward yes or no. It depends on a lot of factors and it's because of the nature of our agricultural systems. Our systems are not well structured. Everybody does what he or she pleases. Uh, uh, the, one of the reasons why a lot of these institutions don't finance a great is the risk element which is not taken off. So because of that factor, you must be quite light because I have a lot of farmers who can attest that there are seasons where they invested and they made so much money. And there are other times that they invested and they lost everything. They are, like, for instance, in times of uh, fall and worm or periods of drought or stuff like that, you can virtually lose everything from your farm. So it's a period of seasons. It depends on the situation. But all things being equal, you could make some windfall if you do the farming. And that, but we would want that situation to be a consistent situation, to be certain. While there is certainty in business, it becomes easy to lure the youth to go into farming. Right. Again, the issue about whether the youth should go into farming. I think sometimes we only think that farming is only about going to the farm and selling the land. They are value, there's a whole value chain. Some yeah. can be involved in the selling of the land, others can be involved in harvesting, others can be involved in harvesting. So there are various elements where the youth can intervene. The most important thing is to make sure that those opportunities are there, they are rich free, they are certain, they are profitable. If that happens, the youth will go into farming. If okay. that does not happen, it will be difficult to convince the youth to go into farming. It's just like a business. If the business is doing well, you don't need anyone to tell you going to do this business. Look at it, this you are going to do it. But if it's not doing well, you might not be encouraged. No matter the kind of advocacy or propaganda you do, you might not be encouraged. So okay. let's put our systems right. Why should we that the youth to be interested in farming? All right. Uh, gentlemen, just hold for me for the last bit because when I come to you, I'll be... Uh, having you proffer solutions in about 40 seconds, one minute each, so we can wrap the conversation. But before that, I'm looking, Evans, at the food price inflation over time, and it's not looking good in terms of the cost of food and how it keeps rising. And I'm not talking about globally, I'm talking about right here in Ghana. So for you, you say cassava is very profitable. Will that profitability hinge on adding the... the or sharing the cost, passing it on to the buyer, for example, and what would be the solutions that you would proffer, mainly for the cassava sector, for government uh, to help so that you can do even more than 500 acres? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, if you look at the cassava, um, just the, the fresh root alone will not, will not give you the, 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 the numbers. What we need to do is rather to add value to it to process, you know, the, the food system, the, the whole value chain, because we have to look at the whole value chain, not only the cassava, the whole food value chain, you know, from the supplier to the production, to the distribution, to harvesting, to marketing, to design, to packaging, you know, and then to even to the final consumer and even um, uh, um, disposers, you know, these are a whole value chain. And I think that if you look at it and they invest in the value chain, that is the money is and i think that government must look at that area how it can strengthen the system the actors the interactions along the value chain and everyone everybody you not know, getting involved and i also believe that uh, 
um, uh, farming is key, like we're asking. We can do so much with cassava. You know, uh, Ezim Bank started a project called Cassava Enterprise Project, and they uh, got about some, some young people, of which I'm one of them, and they trained them and, uh, and put them on the farm. And I tell you what, every one of us, okay, is doing very well. Some have 100 acres, some have 200 acres, some have 300 acres, I have 500 acres, others have 400 acres. You know, assuming um, government take a very strong uh, approach to this, okay, and expand it across the country. And people are doing one acre, two acre, three acre, cassava. You know, we are having processing uh, uh, later across the country and everybody is involved. China did it, now they are into billions. They are exporting starch and ethanol. Thailand did it. They turned the economy around. Indonesia have done it. They've turned the economy around. Brazil has done it. Why can't Ghana do it? That's the question. Why can't Ghana do it? What, what is preventing Ghana? We have the land. We have the, 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 we are farmers who are passionate. We are people who want to go into farming. So what is preventing us? What are all these bothiness preventing farmers, you know, to be able to do what And we have some of the most arable land. I most think, arable land, everywhere. So, so arable just, just a quick one. I just want a very brief answer to this. And, I, and I'll pass it on to the others as well. So does that mean that if we don't do some of these things, I mean, in, in 2022, for example, is it going to affect our food sufficiency, our food security in Ghana? If because it, cassava, a lot of people consume cassava. We are, we are, we are, we are going to have a very Gary. serious issues on our hands if we don't get into it now. Mm. It's, a, it's, it's an agency. It's a matter of agency. It's an agent call. I'm calling the government, the stakeholders, and everyone in, uh, 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 involved to get on the ground. Let's get this thing off the ground right now. Okay. Otherwise, right. we'll be in trouble. All right. Uh, John and Bismarck, I'll start with you, John. Do you agree? So... Food security, food uh, sufficiency, as you uh, give your final comments, uh, is it as bleak as Evans painted that if we don't get it right, we're going to be in a situation? John, I'll start with you. Your final comments. Yes. Yeah. So quickly, yes. If we don't get it right, uh, we're going to have a very serious situation. But I think moving forward, we should look at other elements that affect food prices or other elements that go into uh, cultivation as a farmer. One, I think it's about time we, we, we start producing our own fertilizer in this country on a large scale. Two, the farming, uh, the inputs that we use, uh, I mean, uh, hose, cutlass, and so on and so forth, all these uh, agrochemicals, we should start producing it in, in this country on larger scales so that we are self-sufficient when it comes to agricultural inputs. That way we can be able to control our same prices. I mean, we can be able to control our food prices. And so once we start doing all these things and, and, and producing all the inputs we need in this country for farming, I think we'll move on in the right direction. Because at, at, until then, yes, we can do the value added, um, we can add value, we can do this, we can do this. But if, if fertilizer prices keep on going up because we keep on importing fertilizer, it will still affect food prices. Okay. If uh, Wellington boots the prices keep on going up or rubber prices keep on going up, even though we have rubber, we still export it and then import it as Wellington boots. These are the key problems. These are the key conversations that we should start having. Let's start, let's have a long term plan. The long term plan is in the next 10 years, we are going to be self sufficient with the importation of fertilizer, with the importation of uh, agricultural inputs, so that we can now, our outputs will be now stabilized. That is the only way forward. Right. Thank you so much, Ajon. Let, let, let me get to Bismarck. So your final comments in about 40 seconds on how this will impact our food uh, sufficiency and, and solutions in 40 seconds, if you can. Yeah, sure. So for ensure, ensure food security, there are normally three factors that people consider where the food is available, whether it's accessible, whether it's affordable. Right. So if you don't meet this three criteria, then you, you cannot count yourself as a food secure nation. Uh, from how things are going now, if you're not careful, you might be a situation where the food might not be available, it might not be accessible, it might not be affordable. Even if there are instances where it is affordable, it is available but not affordable, there is still priority to make it. So we have to address it. Key solutions. We are thinking, first of all, uh, we heard that the, the president has uh, urged the various ministries to uh, review their respective flagship programs. Uh, we know the PFJ comes to play now. And we are told that there should be some review. I think that the PFJ itself has some, a lot of implementation gaps. There are a lot of money that we are investing in PFJ that is going with. It's not going to the right people that need it. I think there should be a proper structuring of the PFJ to ensure that those farmers who actually deserve it, as I get it, 
Secondly, government is not talking about a 30% cut in expenditure for the ministries and this. I think we have a different view. We think that a, 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 a sector like food and agri should be exempted, where the money is can be put into productive ventures. Quick productive ventures. Our system, our issues about uh, uh, credit, okay. middle issue. Right. There are countries where farmers are able to get credit as low as 2%, or they even get a, 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 an interest free a, a loan. Ghana's case is not the same. If we can find ways to invest money in a credit system where farmers can access the money, use it, and pay back with little or no interest, I okay. think we should get some way. I think, I think we should get some way. All so right. I think, Italy, let's focus on this. And then let me uh, 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 replay the point that uh, John made. Let's begin to invest in local production of our inputs. Like, right. uh, let's invest in them. Let's keep the money here other than spending so much money to import them when we don't know the situation at the global Stage. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. I, I'll, I'll just give you this because you have a program coming up on Saturday, the 9th of April, the Ghana Youth Agriculture uh, Summit. Just tell us in some 20 seconds, what's it about? So like everything that we are seeing here, you know, uh, is because um, our young people, youth, are not involved massively into the uh, agricultural value chain. Mm. And I think that uh, I'm very passionate about we getting involved because if you get involved, in the agricultural sector from all the other various actors, you know, and they are part of it, you know, uh, through technology, we can be able to expand our productivity. So, so the whole idea is getting, so the whole idea is, is, is getting them uh, yeah. attract, uh, attracted to agriculture, mm. you know, and then try to release, break that disconnect, that image disconnect mm. that they have towards agriculture productivity. So um, we are having the, the first one happening at, at KNUST on the 9th of April. Right. And my, my friend uh, John DeMello also will be John there. John DeMello yes, uh, will, be yes, there. will be there. Yes. John uh, um, Kuma, Deputy John Kuma, Minister. Yes. So the, 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 government, the, government, uh, um, uh, um, the government people will come and tell us what uh, are their plans for the youth in terms of agriculture, in terms of the value chain, in terms of everything agri, you know, how they can help us be able to position ourselves for a major food surplus for our country. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Evan Stremens, our farmer and CEO, Agric Impact Ghana, John Dumelo, uh, actor and farmer. And also, we had joining the conversation, Bismarck Owusu Norte, Programs Officer, uh, Peasant Farmers Association of uh, Ghana. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. into more areas even as we wrap on the AM show. But did you know that the income of a young entrepreneur from some selected businesses is exempt from tax for five years? Any young entrepreneur engaged in manufacturing information and communications technology, agro-processing, energy production, waste processing, tourism and creative arts, horticulture and medicinal plants does not need to pay income tax on all of these activities for their first five years of operation. A young entrepreneur engaged in business that enjoys an initial five-year concession benefits from the following applicable tax rates for an additional five years. Accra and Tema, 15%. Other regional capitals outside the three northern regions, 12.5%. Outside the other regional capitals, 10%. And if you find yourself in the three northern regions, it is 5%. You sh undoubtedly want clarity, more information. Reach out to the nearest GRA office, Ghana Revenue Authority, Integrity, Fairness and Service. Stay with us when we return. More action on the AM Show.